So sorry for this small delay. Uh, we had some technical issue. So good morning, welcome uh, again. I hope that you enjoyed uh, yesterday and I also hope that you enjoy today. It, it looks like it's not being so hot today. We'll see anyway. Well, I, I, I think that the expected temperature for today is only 35 Celsius. <laughs> okay, so let's start. Our uh, first speaker is uh, Serafin Kierkowski. Okay, from VMware. And uh, he's going to talk about what I think is a very relevant uh, hot topic uh, for many of us, which is uh, build systems, because we love C++, but sometimes building applications is not so easy. So, Serafin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. So, hi everyone. My name is Serafim. I'm from VMware. I'm a staff engineer, uh, and uh, I've been working uh, these uh, past uh, few years on C++ uh, toolchain and built evolution inside a product called vCenter. And uh, since maybe a year, I'm also leading the security and compliance effort for the same product. Uh, and both of these combined very nicely with uh, software supply chain security, which we're going to touch very briefly in this presentation. And I'm very passionate about build systems and I've been so ever since I wrote my first make file. This, when you write your first make file, your small, stupid, hello world program suddenly has a life of its own. It has unity, it has, it's complete, all right? And that's something that I want to talk about because when I went in the working world, all right? I didn't see a lot of people who shared my passion for build, test build systems. Like build systems were more like an obstacle. Build systems were not code. We are here to, you know, write C++. We're not here to write make, C, make, or whatever. Just, just do it, right? Uh, we don't care. Uh, and I actually feel that's because people don't understand the history and the development of build systems to, to the time and to know why we're doing the things we're doing today. Uh, and that's what we are trying to do, like dialectics, the nature evolution of how build systems came to be from the beginning of programming to what is more or less today. And we're going to do this by using an example of a profitable software company, I mean legacy company. Uh, so I want to start with a story uh, to illustrate one uh, thesis I have, and that is that uh, people take build systems uh, like natural phenomena, like thunder, mountains, wind, sea, whatever. They see them spawn in and they don't question their existence, why they are the way they are. Uh, they just use them and rarely try to change them. So I was at this meetup five or six years ago and I was talking to a guy from a mid-size mid uh, C++ company and I asked him what build system they, 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 they used. He said, uh, since we moved to CMake, everything is great. And he started talking all about how CMake is great and so on and so forth, but I didn't listen to that. I heard, since we moved to CMake, what did you use before going to CMake? It's... And he said, PHP. They had a homegrown PHP-based build system. And uh, these guys were trying to do some cross-platform, multi-architecture stuff, and doing this in PHP was hell. Now that they had CMake, uh, life was great. Um, so I asked, how did you decide to do this uh, big rewrite? Uh, I mean, uh, upper management doesn't easily let you rewrite an entire build system that you have uh, maintained over the years. And he said, I don't know. We didn't really decide. We went uh, uh, on a Christmas break one year, and when we came back at New Year's, it was there. The PHP files were deleted. CMake list.txt was there. We bow. Yeah? And I asked the other clicks, do you guys know who did it? We don't know, but we don't care. Probably the owners, but that's only a speculation from our part. So, uh, and that's a, that's a great example here, because those people spend a lot of time explaining me how 
CMake was great for them and how it was making their life easier, multi-platform codes, sanitizers, and so on. And this uh, makes me think of a, a quote from one of my favorite games, Build Born. We are born by the build, made men by the build, and undone by the build. If we let our build systems rot sufficiently, we uh, jeopardize our capacity to build software uh, to meet the requirements of today, tomorrow, or even yesterday. So here's an example. You're starting a job at a new company. You're given this uh, code base with a thousand C files, but there's no build system, and you're tasked to figure out how to build this small binary that, you're work that you'll be working on for the next couple of years. The guy that's onboarding you says, well, uh, I started like this, I have my own shell scripts. I don't really know if they're correct, but so that's why I cannot give them to you. The guy that onboarded me said the same, so we're continuing the, <laughs> the sins of the fathers, I guess. Um, and imagine you succeed at building this project, uh, the correct compile options, the link options, and you start coding. I mean, it's a way of living, right? You're coding, you're building, you're, you're shipping. And then it's 2025, and suddenly you want to ship this product to the Department of Defense of the United States. I mean, those guys will really enjoy to understand how you how you built this, right? <laughs> uh, and it's strange because here we all have the intuition that building code by hand with uh, custom built shell scripts is wrong. But the thing is that in most of part of programming, programs were built by hand. They were. Uh, Punch cards sorted and assembled by hand for loom machine, for uh, looms, for uh, maybe the analytical machine if it ever existed, for musical machines, uh, for the first, for all computers up until the 1960s uh, when uh, magnetic tapes and discs uh, become viable. And here uh, you have a loom, and I guess in 4K, uh, in music box. Uh, and they were basically the same uh, principle of programming. You sort the, the stack uh, of punch cards, and the uh, loom gives the correct patterns, and you replace the cylinder with the respective dots, and the uh, metallic picks are picking the right tones to produce the melody. Uh, von Neumann, there's, a, there's an anecdote about John von Neumann, who uh, uh, was not very keen of his students writing symbolic assemblers. Um, for doing what he calls clerical work, meaning translating assembly to uh, machine code. Um, now, our company begins. We're going to call it Jingle Labs. I, I actually don't, uh, I thought about it like five minutes before the talk. I don't know if there's a company called Jingle Labs that's completely <laughs> coincidental. We are founded in 1971. What we're doing is we're making money. That's all we do. Uh, we don't write Cobo or Fortran. We only code in assembly. Our only tool is assembler. And our competitor is Bell Labs. And they are main competitors until the very next year. Do you guys know what happens in 1972? See? Yes, the second edition of Unix. And see, when our programmers see the C language, they're in love, and they, and they want to write it. Soon, we bend the knee, and we introduce C in our code base, not only assembly. I mean, who wouldn't compile that, right? That's actually a quote from uh, the second edition of Phoenix, actually. Um, and uh, C came with another way of being built. Like, C was being built in object files. Object files were being linked in, in programs. And you could do all kinds of permutations using uh, the Unix shell, using wildcards, and so on and so forth. And uh, our way of building, uh, and our code base was looking like this. In the beginning, we had one main .c, and uh, by 1973, we had like a, a whooping 15 files. And how we build them, we actually go, got into the directory, and we were issuing cc star c, and we were paying for the best. Uh, now this got this got an issue, right? Uh, you can mistype cc star c, and you can type cc star o by by uh, by by chance. That means that you won't be compiling your code. And this made us waste hours a week. But that's a price to pay. I mean, what can we do about it? Like, there's nothing to do about it. 
and we weren't to live. We weren't to live with it. After all, life wasn't that wor that that bad. But life can be better. There's a certain Steve Johnson in 1976 who wasted a whole morning debugging an incremental build issue. Actually, he was the incremental build issue because he was issuing CC star O on uh, some object files that, the, the, where he had allegedly already fixed the bug, but he was still seeing it in the in the binary. So he stormed into his colleagues uh, Stuart Feldman's office, and they both uh, brainstormed uh, the make build system. And the first build system was created like this because someone wasted a morning debugging uh, incremental build issue. And Make was very good. Make was being done by absolutely everyone for a very, very long time. If you try to look in the history of uh, software and so on, you, you will very hardly find some build system between 1976 and, 1950, uh, and 1995. Right? There are others, but Make is, Make, Make is the main one. And during, that, and during this time, the storage uh, got bigger with hard disk smaller, more CPUs, more RAM, more operating systems, more operating platforms, and uh, more ways to make money. So we needed to leverage those, those more ways to make money, and we ne needed to target those, those platforms. So we started adding if devs to our code, if devs in our make files. And uh, yeah, it was doable, but still complicated. Still, as I said, we are in the business of making money, not build, not build, build, build systems. And someone somewhere on the, on the planet was fed up with uh, writing himself all the checks for, for the platform. And he decided to create a meta build system that would create a build system that is already configured for the, for the target platform. Auto Tools, to the best of my knowledge, is the first, build system, uh, the first meta build system to exist. And uh, this is the graph of dependency if you really want to do a complete uh, auto tools built by, by, by hand. I mean, that's really complicated, and we at, Jeng at Jingle Ops were not really convinced that we wanted to implement this in our code. And we, we had the choice. So let's see what we're going to choose. In 1995 as well, uh, the first release of Zlib appeared. And our executives understood that uh, somehow we can leverage open source to not do something at, uh, at in-house, in and they decided that we need to drop our compression li library and use this one. But ZTIP uses auto tools. We're using make. So we have an issue. What are we going to do? In 1995, Java also happens. And our developers also love it. We still uh, don't have a Java build system until be released six years later. Uh, and the only way to build it is, is with make. And, with, uh, and at this point, we decided we'll stick with Make. Make will just go out to the other build systems when they're available, and we'll build Java with Make natively until now. Uh, and when they, yeah. Uh, something interesting to, 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 to notice at this, uh, at this point is the, is the uh, appearance of uh, scones. Uh, I think it's a really peculiar build system. Uh, I really hate maintaining this stuff. Um, because it's a Turing complete, you have a Python interpreter where you can mine Bitcoin if you wish, uh, while you're while you're doing a build. Like it's a it's a terrible mess. We briefly envisioned to adopt this at Jingle Labs, but uh, we thought that for maintaining our thousand, uh, our thousands of files, it's not it's not doable. Uh, so. So. A uh, few brief notes about Java. So in the 20th century, Java was becoming more and more popular with, uh, with more and more libraries being, uh, be, be, becoming available readily. And uh, new, a new kind of build system uh, appeared. It was Maven who had an integrated uh, package manager. Right? Our Java developers loved it. Uh, and soon we started deploying uh, Maven in-house with the OTAN projects staying, staying like, like they are. Uh, so we were keeping, we were piling up legacy code with make, calling out to Autotools, calling out to Ant, calling out to, uh, to Maven, and uh, bit by bit we were moving towards the newest uh, of, uh, of languages. So, and while all this Java nonsense was happening, the C++, the C++ world was also changing. So with the um, 
uh, with bigger hard disks came bigger code bases and more powerful CPUs. That, mean, that meant uh, uh, less performant programs, and we needed our build to be fast. And someone somewhere decided that they are going to distribute the build across multiple machines. And, they are, uh, and the idea was, some, uh, was simple. You take uh, a C file, you pre-process it, and you send it to a build slave that allegedly has the same configuration as your build host. And then you have uh, the, the object file as you would have built it yourself. But this is uh, distributed across an entire fleet of, uh, of machines, so this happens really fast. And there is a paper from 2004 that uh, says that uh, at that point, there were uh, speed ups of up to uh, 4x in certain cases. After distributed comp compilation proved to be a viable solution, compile caching happened, which was basically the same, but we would cache the, the artifacts once they were built, uh, and they use them um, on, a, on a subsequent comp compilation. So there are these uh, numbers, like 100 text given in the in C caches of official web page, but that's like really normal because they're literally doing nothing after they have cached the uh, they, after they have cached the, uh, the artifact. So they were really good. They provided real good speed ups, but they had issues, and those issues were in the end rooted in. Uh, uh, in the in the in the build system, because if the build system couldn't provide sufficient uh, isolation of the of the inputs, the the build slaves would never be able to produce deterministic uh, uh, results. Uh, so, this CNC cache would be uh, would prove to would prove to fail if uh, the machines that, that were used to uh, either. Or, build the artifacts or store the artifacts, had uh, different compilers, different runtime libraries, different, different sysroots. Uh, and um, this begs the question, how are we sure that the builds that we are giving to the customers are deterministic? And once they have an issue, we can reproduce them in-house again so we can debug them. All right. Uh, this CC showed us that our build is not as deterministic as we think. So uh, in the 2000s, all kinds of uh, build harnesses were starting, were starting to, to emerge using uh, uh, con containers. Of course, me being from VMware, I'm sticking the VMware SXI on the slide. Um, and the idea was simple. You had a template VM with the exact configuration of a, of a, build, of a build machine, with the exact version of the compiler, with the exact version of uh, runtime dependencies. And every time you run the build inside, you get, the, you get the same thing, because you literally have the same thing. Um, but build harnesses are, are another topic, and I really don't want to get into there. But th this thing is going to be um, continued later on, and uh, it is going to become even more relevant in the, in the following years with uh, supply chain uh, security requirements for uh, isolated builds. But at this point, the issue was not sec uh, securing the Department of Defense. The issue was uh, making sure that we can debug the software once uh, it got back from, uh, from the customer with, with core dumps. So 2010s, the C++, C++ 11 came. It uh, brought us a new memory model. Suddenly, there were threads. Uh, there was a new ABI. Our build engineers were so happy to hear that suddenly they have to figure out how to maintain libraries with uh, incompatible APIs, with but that can completely link uh, together. And at the same time, languages with integrated build systems arrived. Right? That's uh, just a note here, here in passing. Uh, what we saw earlier in Maven here was already integrated completely with uh, the base uh, distribution you, go you get when you download uh, a language. Right? Uh, so, again, same same uh, decade. Uh, RAM got cheaper, uh, storage got cheaper. There was more CPU, and code bases were getting bigger. Right? The problems of C cache of compile times they were getting deeper just because the scale was increasing. Uh, so here we need a, a new solution. We need a solution that is different by by nature. Uh, and we already hinted to the issue, and the issue is that. 
humans are imperfect and they cannot uh, realistically declare all their inputs. I guess you're all writing, you have written make at some point in your life. Who has declared the compiler as an input to their recipes? Okay, take hands. <laughs> yeah, take hands. Uh, and the compiler is part of the two chain. The sysroot is part, the, yeah. Um, uh, so a new generation of build systems arrived and they, they use the term hermetic to denote uh, what's essentially uh, getting all the, which is essentially running all commands in a dedicated container. Only the inputs that were declared required for a specific action would be symlinked into the container. So if you, before, before you were linking the Zlib from, uh, from the build host, uh, and you didn't declare it I, I, in this case, you, you, won't, you won't have it, right? Uh, and actually, the development of these build systems uh, began in <laughs> ten, 10 years ago at, at, the big, at the big software companies, but uh, they, it was only made public like in the last uh, couple of, in the last 10 years. Uh, so, hermetic build systems uh, are loosely separated in three phases, and each of the three phases uh, allows Different uh, different actions to be performed. For instance, at port phase, you can per perform I/O. Uh, you can go fetch uh, an archive from somewhere, un unarchive it, and expose its contents uh, natively to the rest of the build system, so they can refer only to this header, to this library, or or something else. At the analysis phase, I/O is not possible. The uh, runtime itself prohibits it. Uh, at this stage, uh, the build graph is created, right? And at the build phase, only the build commands are executed. This hermeticity actually allowed distributed compilation and caches to be uh, implemented uh, correctly, correctly for the first time. Right. And this time it was not limited to only C, because this C and C cache is limited uniquely to C uh, for the essence of it working, like uh, pre-processing the file, uh, uh, pre-processing the file, and so on and so forth. So, uh, Dialectic of build systems. Now it's 2023. Solar winds happened. Colonial oil happened. The U.S. Uh, uh, government issued several executive orders treating uh, software supply chains. Uh, I think this month, uh, a new um, um, uh, uh, standards uh, from I think from Google came out that is defining uh, compliance levels for software su supply chain. We are having. We were talking about hermetics builds with uh, dedicated sandboxes for each um, uh, action and uh, isolated build harnesses. I mean, that's pretty good. I mean, we started with earning an assembler by hand and now, and now we're in the future, basically. So I get this often uh, when I work with uh, junior engineers uh, that I on board. Uh, I explain them how our build works, what is required to get stuff done, and, and so on and so forth. And they ca cannot refrain from telling me that we got it all wrong, that we don't understand how to make builds, and it's just too complicated. We should be just using the play button on Visual Studio, right? And I'm the inspired uh, uh, sage from the mountain, all bearded, that comes down and, and says, no, actually, the play button is not better. It's better that we do the command below. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? No questions? They are waking up. Oh. So I want to understand a little bit like your conclusion of your talk. So imagine I'm writing a software library and I want to like from Green, uh, Greenfield software library, I want to test it in SCI or like build and test it. So what would you use? What would you, would you like as a sage of the mountain? How would, would you would, would you recommend me? 
Well, I was should I use make F sanitize address? No, no, no. no it, it was actually a joke. I, uh, it's a joke that I really liked it because I don't know if everyone has noticed the small double in the beginning of the command line. Um, uh, so, so what I suggest is always have a build system and rely on your build system to provide you sufficiently fine-grained tasks to, for you to execute them. Uh, there were uh, developments maybe two or three years ago where you could uh, uh, essentially apply Terraform uh, recipes on AWS Cloud using Bazel, which is, I mean, this doesn't really sound like something hermetic by itself. Uh, but yeah, use a build system and uh, rely on your build system. Don't uh, compile stuff by hand. Docker plus CMake works? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>